Chapter 2. Each is great in his own place. According to the Shankya philosophy, nature is composed of three forces called in Sanskrit sattva, raja, and tamas. These are manifested in the physical world, are what we may call equilibrium, activity and inertness. Tamas is typified as darkness or inactivity. Rajas is activity, expresses attraction or repulsion, and sattva is the equilibrium of the two. In every man there are these three forces. Sometimes Thomas prevails. We become lazy, we cannot move, we are inactive, bound down by certain ideas or by mere dullness. At other times activity prevails, and at still other times that calm balancing of both. Again in different men one of these forces is generally predominant. The characteristic of one man is in activity, dullness and laziness. That of another activity, power, manifestation of energy, and still another we find the sweetness, calmness and gentleness, which are due to the balancing of both action and inaction. So in all creation, in animals, plants and men, we find the more or less typical manifestation of all of these different forces. Karma Yoga has specially to deal with these three factors by teaching what they are and how to employ them. It helps us to do our work better. Human society is a graded organization. We all know about morality and we all know about duty, but at the same time we find that in different countries the significance of morality varies greatly. What is regarded as moral in one country may in another be considered perfectly immoral. For instance, in one country cousins may marry, in another it is thought to be very immoral. In one men may marry their sister-in-law, in another it is regarded as immoral. In one country people may marry only once, in another many times, and so forth. Similarly, in all other departments of morality, we find the standard varies greatly. Yet we have the idea that there must be a universal standard of morality. So it is with duty. The idea of duty varies much among different nations. In one country, if a man does not do certain things, people will say he has acted wrongly. While if he does his very things in another country, people will say that he did not act rightly. And yet we know that there must be some universal idea of duty. In the same way, one class of society thinks that certain things are among its duty, while another class thinks quite the opposite and would be horrified if it had to do those things. Two ways are left open to us. The way of the ignorant, who think that there is only one way to truth and that all the rest are wrong and the way of the wise who admit that according to our mental constitution or the different planes of existence in which we are, duty and morality may vary. The important thing is to know that there are gradations of duty and of morality, that the duty of one state of life in one set of circumstances will not and cannot be that of another. To illustrate, all great teachers have taught, resist not evil, that non-resistance is the highest moral ideal. We all know that if a certain number of us attempted to put the maxim fully into practice, the whole social fabric would fall to pieces. The wicked would take possession of our properties and of our lives and would do whatever they liked with us. Even if only one day of such non-resistance were practiced, it would lead to disaster. Yet intuitively, in our heart, our hearts, we feel the truth of the teaching, resist not evil. This seems to us to be the highest ideal, yet to teach this doctrine only would be equivalent to condemning a vast portion of mankind. Not only so, it would be making men feel that they were always doing wrong and causing them scruples of conscience in all their actions. It would weaken them, and that constant self-disapproval would breed more vice than any other weakness would. To the man who has begun to hate himself, the gate to degeneration is already opened, and the same is true of a nation. Our first duty is not to hate ourselves, because to advance we must have faith in ourselves first and then in God. He who has no faith in himself can never have faith in God. Therefore, the only alternative remaining to us is to recognize that duty and morality vary under different circumstances. Not that the man who resists evil is doing what is always and in itself wrong, but that in different circumstances in which he is placed it may become even his duty to resist evil. In reading the Bhagavad Gita, many of you in Western countries may have felt astonished at the second chapter, wherein Sri Krishna calls Arjuna a hypocrite and a coward because of his refusal to fight or offer resistance on account of his adversaries being his friends and relatives, making the plea that non-resistance was the highest ideal of love. 
This is a great lesson for all of us to learn that in all matters the two extremes are alike. The extreme positive and the extreme negative are always similar when the vibrations of light are too slow. We do not see them, nor do we see them when they are too rapid. So with sound, when very low in pitch we do not hear it, when very high we do not hear it either. Of like nature is the difference between resistance and non-resistance. One man does not resist because he is weak, lazy and cannot, not because he will not. The other man knows that he can strike an irresistible blow if he likes, yet he not only does not strike, but blesses his enemies. The one who from weakness resists not commits a sin, and as such cannot receive any benefit from the non-resistance, while the other would commit a sin by offering resistance. Buddha gave up his throne and renounced his position. That was true renunciation. But there cannot be any question of renunciation in the case of the beggar who has nothing to renounce. So we must always be careful about what we really mean when we speak of this non-resistance and ideal love. We must first take care to understand whether we have the power of resistance or not. Then having the power, if we renounce it and do not resist it, we are doing a grand act of love. But if we cannot resist and yet at the same time try to deceive ourselves into the belief that we are actuated by motives of the highest love, we are doing the exact opposite. Arjuna became a coward at the sight of the mighty array against him. His love made him forget his duty toward his country and king. That is why Sri Krishna told him that he was a hypocrite. Thou talkest like a wise man, but thy actions betray thee to be a coward. Therefore stand up and fight. Such is the central idea of karma yoga. The karma yogi is the man who understands that the highest ideal is non-resistance, and who also knows that this non-resistance is the highest manifestation of power in actual possession, and also what is called the resisting of evil is but a step on the way towards a manifestation of this highest power, namely non-resistance. Before reaching this highest ideal, man's duty is to resist evil. Let him work, let him fight, let him strike straight from the shoulder. Then only, when he has gained the power to resist, will non-resistance be a virtue. I once met a man in my country whom I had known before as a very stupid, dull person who knew nothing and had not the desire to know anything and was living the life of a brute. He asked me what he should do to know God, how he was to get set free. Can you tell a lie? I asked him. No, he replied then you must learn to do so. It is better to tell a lie than to be a brute or a log of wood. You are inactive. You have not certainly reached the highest state, which is beyond all actions, calm and serene. You are too dull even to do something wicked. That was an extreme case, of course, and I was joking with him, but what I meant was that a man must be active in order to pass through activity to perfect calmness. Inactivity should be avoided by all means. Activity always means resistance. Resist all evils, mental and physical, and when you have succeeded in resisting, then will calmness come. It is very easy to say, hate nobody, resist not evil, but we know what that kind of thing generally means in practice. When the eyes of society are turned towards us, we may make a show of non-resistance, but in our hearts it is a canker all the time. We feel the utter want of calm of non-resistance. We feel that would be better for us to resist. If you desire wealth and know at the same time that the whole world regards him who aims at wealth as a very wicked man, you perhaps will not dare to plunge into the struggle for wealth, yet your mind will be running day and night after money. This is hypocrisy and will serve no purpose. Plunge into the world and then, after a time, when you have suffered and enjoyed all there is, will renunciation come? Then will calmness come. So fulfill your desire for power and everything else. And after you fulfill the desire will come the time when you will know that they are all very little things. But until you have fulfilled your desire, until you have passed through the activity, it is impossible for you to come to the state of calmness, serenity and self-surrender. These ideas of serenity and renunciation have been preached for thousands of years. Everyone has heard of them from childhood and yet we see very few in the world who have really reached that stage. I do not know if I have seen twenty persons in my life who are really calm and non-resisting, and I have traveled over half the world. Every man should take up his own ideal and endeavor to accomplish it. 
That is a sure way to progress than taking up another man's ideal, which he can never hope to accomplish. For instance, we take a child and at once give him the task of walking 20 miles. Either the little one dies or one in a thousand crawls to 20 miles to reach the end exhausted and half dead. That is like what we generally try to do with the world. All the men and women in any society are not of the same mind capacity or of the same power to do things. They must have different ideals, and we have no right to sneer at any ideal. Let every one do the best he can for realizing his own ideal, nor is it right that I should be judged by your standard or you by mine. The apple tree should not be judged by the standard of the oak, nor the oak by that of the apple tree. To judge the apple tree you must take the apple standard, and for the oak its own standard. Unity in variety is the plan of creation. However men and women may vary individually, there is unity in the background. The different individual characters and classes of men and women are natural variations in creation. Hence we ought not to judge them by the same standard or put the same ideal before them. Such a course creates only an unnatural struggle, and the result is that man begins to hate himself and is hindered from becoming religious and good. Our duty is to encourage everyone in the struggle to live up to its own highest ideal and strive at the same time to make the ideal as near as possible to the truth. In the Hindu system of morality, we find that this fact has been recognized from very ancient times, and in their scriptures and books on ethics, different rules are laid down for the different classes of men, the householder, the sannyasin, the man who renounced the world, and the student. The life of every individual, according to the Hindu scriptures, has its peculiar duties apart from what belongs in common to universal humanity. The Hindu begins life as a student, then he marries and becomes a householder. In old age he retires and lastly he gives up the world and becomes a sannyasin. To each of these stages of life certain duties are attached. No one of these stages is intrinsically superior to another. The life of the married man is quite as great as that of the celibate who has devoted himself to religious work. The scavenger in the street is quite as great and glorious as the king on his throne. Take him off his throne and make him do the work of the scavenger and see how he fares. Take up the scavenger and see how he will rule. It is useless to say that the man who lives out of the world is a greater man than he who lives in the world. It is much more difficult to live in the world and worship God than to give it up and live a free and easy life. The four stages of life in India have in latter times been reduced to two, that of the householder and of the monk. The householder marries and carries on his duties as a citizen, and the duty of the other is to devote his energies wholly to religion, to preach and to worship God. I shall read you a few passages from the Maha Nirvana Tantra, which treats of this subject, and you will see that it is a very difficult task for a man to be a householder and perform all his duties perfectly. Quote, the householder should be devoted to God. The knowledge of God should be his goal in life. Yet he must work constantly, perform all his duties, he must give up the fruits of his actions to God. Unquote. It is the most difficult thing in this world to work and not care for the results, to help a man and never think that he ought to be grateful, to do some good work and at the same time never look to see whether it brings you name or fortune, or nothing at all. Even the most errant coward becomes brave when the world praises him. A fool can do heroic deeds when the approbation of society is upon him. But for a man to constantly do good without caring for the appropriation of his fellow men is indeed the highest sacrifice man can perform. The great duty of the householder is to earn a living, but he must take care that he does not do it by telling lies or by cheating or by robbing others, and he must remember that his life is for the service of God and the poor. Knowing that mother and father are the visible representations of God, the householder always and by all means must please them. If the mother is pleased and the father, God is pleased with the man. That child is really a good child who never speaks harsh words to his parents. Before parents, one must not utter jokes, must not show restlessness, must not show anger or temper. Before mother or father, a child must bow down low and stand up in their presence and must not take a seat until they order him to sit. 
If the householder has food and drink and clothes without first seeing it his mother and his father, his children, his wife and the poor are supplied, he is committing a sin. The mother and the father are the causes of his body, so a man must undergo a thousand troubles in order to good do them. Even so is his duty to his wife. No man should scold his wife, and he must always maintain her as if she were his own mother. And even when he has the greatest difficulties and troubles, he must not show anger to his wife. He who thinks of another woman besides his wife, if he touches her even with his mind, that man goes to a dark hell. Before women, he must not talk in proper language and never brag of his powers. He must not say, I have done this and I have done that. The householder must always please his wife with money, clothes, love, faith, and words like nectar, and never do anything to disturb her. The man who has succeeded in getting the love of a chaste wife has succeeded in his religion and has all the virtues. The following are duties towards children. A son should be lovingly reared up to his fourth year. He should be educated till he is sixteen. When he is twenty years of age, he should be employed in some work. He should then be treated affectionately by his father as an equal. Exactly in the same manner, the daughter should be brought up and should be educated with the greatest care. And when she marries, the father ought to give her jewels and wealth. Then the duty of the man is towards his brothers and sisters and towards the children of his brothers and sisters. If they are poor and towards his other relatives, his friend and his servants, then his duties are towards the people of the same village and the poor and anyone that comes to help for help. Having sufficient means, if the householder does not take care to give to his relatives and to the poor, know him to be only a brute. He is not a human being. Excessive attachment to food, clothes, and the tending of the body and dressing of the hair should be avoided. The householder must be pure in heart and clean in body, always active and always ready for work. To his enemies, the householder must be a hero. Them he must resist. That is the duty of the householder. He must not sit down in a corner and weep and talk nonsense about non-resistance. If he does not show himself a hero to his enemies, he has not done his duty. And to his friends and relatives, he must be as gentle as a lamb. It is a duty of the householder not to pay reverence to the wicked, because if he reverences the wicked people of the world, he patronizes wickedness. And it will be a great mistake if he disregards those who are worthy of respect, the good people. He must not be gushing in his friendship. He must not go out of his way making friends everywhere. He must watch the actions of men he wants to make friends with and their dealings with other men, reason upon them, and then make friends. These three things he must not talk of. He must not talk in public of his own fame. He must not preach his own name or his own powers. He must not talk of his wealth or of anything that has been told to him privately. A man must not say he is poor or that he is wealthy. He must not brag of his wealth. Let him keep his own counsel. This is his religious duty. This is not merely worldly wisdom. If a man does not do so, he may be held to be immoral. The householder is the basis, the prop of the whole society. He is the principal earner. The poor, the weak, the children, and the women who do not work all live upon the householder, so there must be certain duties that he has to perform. And these duties must make him feel strong to perform them and not make him think that he is doing things beneath his ideal. Therefore, if he has done something weak or has made some mistake, he must not say so in public. And if he is engaged in some enterprise and know he is sure to fail in it, he must not speak of it. Such self-exposure is not only uncalled for, but also unnerves the man and makes him unfit for the performance of his legitimate duties in life. At the same time, he must struggle hard to acquire these things, firstly knowledge and secondly wealth. It is his duty, and he does not do this duty he is nobody. A householder who does not struggle to get wealth is immoral. If he is lazy and content to lead an idle life, he is immoral, because upon him depend hundreds. If he gets riches, hundreds of others will be thereby supported. If there were not in this city hundreds who had striven to become rich and who had acquired wealth, where would all this civilization and all these alms houses and great houses be? Going after wealth in such a case is not bad, because that wealth is for distribution. The householder is the center of life in society. It is a worship for him to acquire and spend wealth nobly. 
for the householder who struggles to become rich by good means and for good purposes is doing practically the same thing for the attainment of salvation as the anchorite does in his cell when he is praying. For in them we see only the different aspects of the same virtue of self-surrender and self-sacrifice prompted by the feeling of devotion to God and to all that is His. He must struggle to acquire a good name by all means. He must not gamble. He must not move in the company of the wicked. He must not tell lies and must not be the cause of troubles to others. Often people enter into things they have not the means to accomplish, with the result that they cheat others to attain their own ends. Then there is in all things a time factor to be taken into consideration. What at one time might be a failure would perhaps at another time be a very great success. The householder must speak the truth and speak gently, using words which people like, which will do good to others, nor should he talk of the business of other men. The householder, by digging tanks, by planting trees on the roadside, by establishing rest houses for men and animals, by making roads and building bridges, goes towards the same goal as the greatest yogi. This is one part of the doctrine of karma yoga, activity, the duty of the householder. There is a passage later on where it says that, if the householder dies in battle, fighting for his country or his religion, he comes to the same goal as the yogi by meditation, thereby showing that what is duty for one is not duty for another. At the same time, it does not say that the duty is lowering and the other elevating. Each duty has its own place, and according to the circumstance in which we are placed, we must perform our duties. Our idea comes out of all of this, the condemnation of all weakness. This is a particular idea in all our teaching which I like, either in philosophy or in religion or in work. If you read the Vedas, you will find these words always repeated. Fearlessness, fear nothing. Fear is a sign of weakness. A man must go about his duties without taking notice of the sneers and ridicules of the world. If a man retires from the world to worship God, he must not think that those who live in the world and work for the good of the world are not worshiping God. Neither must those who live in the world for wife and children think that those who give up the world are low vagabonds. Each is great in his own place. This thought I will illustrate by a story. A certain king used to inquire of all the sannyasins that came to his country, which is the greater man? He who gives up the world and becomes a sannyasin, or he who lives in the world and performs his duties as a householder. Many wise men sought to solve the problem. Some asserted that the sannyasin was the greater, upon which the king demanded that they should prove their assertion. When they could not, he ordered them to marry and become householders. Then others came and said, The householder who performs his duty is the greater man. Of them, too, the king demanded proof. When they could not give them, he made them also settle down as householders. At last there came a young sannyasin, and the king similarly inquired of him also. He answered, Each, O king, is equally great in his place. Prove this to me, asked the king. I will prove it to you, said the sannyasin, but you must first come and live as I do for a few days, that I may be able to prove to you what I say. The king consented and followed the sannyasin out of his own territory and passed through many other countries until they came to a great kingdom. In the capital of that kingdom a great ceremony was going on. The king and the sannyasin heard the noise of drums and music, and heard also the criers. The people were assembled in the streets in gala dress, and a great proclamation was being made. The king and the sannyasin stood there to see what was going on. The crier was proclaiming loudly that the princess, daughter of the king of that country, was about to choose a husband from among those assembled before her. It was an old custom in India for princesses to choose husbands in this way. Each princess had certain ideas of the sort of man she wanted for a husband. Some would have to be the handsomest man, others would have only the most learned, others again the richest, and so on. All the princes of the neighborhood put on their bravest attire and presented themselves before her. Sometimes they too had their own criers to enumerate their advantages and the reasons why they hoped the princess would choose them. The princess was taken round on a throne in a most splendid array, and looked at and heard about them. If she was not pleased with what she saw and heard, she said to her bearers, Move on, and no more notice was taken of the rejected suitors. If, however, the princess was pleased with any one of them, she threw a garland of flowers over to him, and he became her husband. The princess of the country to which our king and sannyasin had come was having one of these interesting ceremonies. 
She was the most beautiful princess in the world, and the husband of the princess would be ruler of a kingdom after her father's death. The idea of this princess was to marry the handsomest man, but she could not find the right one to please her. Several times these meetings had taken place, but the princess could not select a husband. This meeting was the most splendid of all. More people than ever had come to it. The princess came in on a throne, and the bearers carried her from place to place. She did not seem to care for any one, and every one became disappointed that this meeting also was going to be a failure. Just then came a young man, a sannyasin, handsome, as if the sun had come down to the earth, and stood in one corner of the assembly, watching what was going on. The throne with the princess came near him, and as soon as she saw the beautiful sannyasin, she stopped and threw the garland over to him. The young sannyasin seized the garland and threw it off, exclaiming, What nonsense is this? I am a sannyasin. What is marriage to me? The king of that country thought that perhaps this man was poor, and so dared not marry the princess, and said to him, With my daughter goes half my kingdom now, and the whole kingdom after my death, and put the garland again on that sannyasin. The young man threw it off once more, saying, Nonsense, I do not want to marry, and walked quickly away from the assembly. Now the princess had fallen so much in love with this young man that she said, I must marry this man or I shall die. And she went after him to bring him back. Then our other sannyasin, who had brought the king there, said to him, King, let us follow this pair. So they walked after them, but at a good distance behind, the young sannyasin, who had refused to marry the princess, walked out into the country for several miles. When he came to a forest and entered it, the princess followed him, and the two other followed them. Now this young sannyasin was well acquainted with that forest and knew all the intricate paths in it. He suddenly passed into one of these and disappeared, and the princess could not discover him. After trying for a long time to find him, she sat down under a tree and began to weep, for she did not know the way out. Then our king and the other sannyasin came up to her and said, Do not weep, we will show you the way out of the forest but it is too dark for us to find it now. Here is a big tree, let us rest under it, and in the morning we will go early and show you the road. Now a little bird and his wife and their three little ones lived on that tree in a nest. This little bird looked down and saw the three people under the tree and said to his wife, My dear, what shall we do? Here are some guests in a house and it is winter and we have no fire. So he flew away and got a bit of burning firewood in his beak and dropped it before the guest, to which they added fuel and made a blazing fire. But the little bird was not satisfied. He said again to his wife, My dear, what shall we do? There is nothing to give these people to eat and they are hungry. We are householders. It is our duty to feed anyone who comes into the house. I must do what I can. I will give them my body. So he plunged into the midst of the fire and perished. The guests saw him falling and tried to save him, but he was too quick for them. The little bird's wife saw what her husband did, and she said, Here are three persons, and only one little bird for them to eat. It is not enough. It is my duty as a wife not to let my husband's effort go in vain. Let them have my body also. Then she fell into the fire and was burned to death. Then the three baby birds, when they saw what was done, and that there was still not enough food for the three guests, said, Our parents have done what they could, and still it was not enough. It is our duty to carry on the work of our parents. Let our bodies go too. And they all dashed down to the fire also. Amazed at what they saw, the three people could not, of course, eat these birds. They passed the night without food. And in the morning, the king and the sannyasin showed the princess the way, and she went back to her father. Then the sannyasin said to the king, King, you have seen that each is great in his own place. If you want to live in this world, live like those birds, ready at any moment to sacrifice yourself for others. If you want to renounce the world, be like that young man to whom the most beautiful woman in a kingdom wears nothing. If you want to be a householder, hold your life a sacrifice for the welfare of others. And if you choose a life of renunciation, do not even look at beauty and money and power. Each is great in his own place, but the duty of the one is not the duty of the other.'"